Welcome to Sweet Valley Diaries, the podcast where we ask the question, if you're not a perfect size six, what are you even doing at this school? A quick heads up, this episode was my first attempt at recording remotely, and the sound quality is weird. My guest and I are three time zones apart. The miracles of modern technology are full of fabulous learning curves, am I right? Book four, Power Play. The Wakefield twins have taken sides against each other. Hey, there we go. Hi. Hi. Hi, welcome to Sweet Valley Diaries. I'm your host, Marissa Flaxbart. And oh my gosh, am I excited to have the guest with me that I have been trying to get via FaceTime for just forever, but she's so hard to get. She's my best friend since seventh grade. Seventh grade? Anyway, yeah. her name is Mary Kay Battles. Yay! Yay! Clapping sounds. Mary Kay Battles, how about you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Mary Kay Battles. <laughs> 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 what else Great. am I supposed to say? I don't know. That's who I am. That's true. That's a really good point, Mary Kate. What do you do for a living? I am a full-time photojournalist. Uh, Mary Kate is a businesswoman and a wonderful photographer, and she owns her own business, and she is now just really happy to be joining the sisterhood of Sweet Valley High readers, right, Mary Kate? Marissa, that is false. That is false. (laughs) This has changed our whole relationship that you made me read this book. Uh, I still love you, Marissa. But I, you know, I'm also the girl who never owned a Barbie, hates pink. And so for you to make me read a book about girls in high school in a sorority is just, well, I have some words. But you loved high school. You know what? I... I'm one of those weird people who did like high school, but, you know, I didn't, I wasn't in a sorority. You don't want to go back. (laughs) No, I definitely don't want to go back. Okay, well, let's not leave our listeners in suspense. The book we're talking about, as they will already know, is called Power Play. And, um, boy, there's a lot of twists and turns in this book, huh? Too many. Too many, Marissa. Um, (laughs) One thing that we'll have to get to at some point with this book is that this is a Maybe the best example I can think of, of a book that boggles the mind in terms of time frame. Like, these books, we're only on book four, but these books go on for over a hundred volumes. And they're always juniors at Sweet Valley High. Not only Elizabeth and Jessica Wakefield, but everybody pretty much that they hang out with. (laughs) They're juniors at Sweet Valley High, nothing changes. And yet... There's a dance every week, you know, but still, most of the books, they take place over the course of a week or so. This book seems to take place over, it must, it has to be the course of an entire school year. Um, But then where do all the other books happen? And all the other books definitely happen after this book, uh, because one of our main characters is changed by the end of this book, uh, as we will soon explain, and she remains changed for the rest of the book. Okay. Well, that's, you know, great to know that her um, fat shaming has carried her on to uh, con- continue her uh, new relationship with food and exercise in an unhealthy way. I'm really glad this carries on for hundreds of more books. That's just Okay, great. okay. But we're we're uh, burying the lead here. Um, look, you know, we have some segments here on the Sweet Valley Diaries podcast. So the first thing I want to ask you about is the cover of the book. You've got your book, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Describe this. Describe the cover to me a little bit. Okay. Well, it's the lovely Wakefield twins, and they are just looking at each other. And, you know, I'm going to guess that Jessica's on the left. What do you think, Marissa? Well, this was what I was going to ask you, because in most books, it's obvious. In most covers, it's obvious. On this cover, the girl on the left is wearing a red gingham collared shirt. And on the right, she's got her hair pulled back a little bit, and she's wearing a white collar shirt, but that's all we see. It's like an intense close-up of their face. I actually love this cover, I have to say, for all its mystery. It's been the screensaver on my phone for the past month, Uh, which is kind of weird, but whatever. I'm embracing (laughs) that Sweet Valley High lifestyle. So, 
I think you're right. I think the Red Gang of Shirt is Jessica. Listeners, write in. Maybe on Twitter. <laughs> Ask me Valley on Twitter. Because I am not entirely sure. But I think the girl on the right is more prim looking, and that's kind of Elizabeth's deal. What do you think? I, I think so. I think so. But that's about it. They look very intense. They're very intensely looking at each other. Yeah. And this book promises a showdown between these two twins, which is kind of fucked up because this book is not about them, you know? (laughs) Right. It's about Robin. Poor, poor Robin. So let's get into the plot of the book. Okay. Uh, So... Robin Wilson, we met in book three. I don't know if you listened to the episode for book three, but sure when did. I listened back to it, I was like, oh, right. Because uh, it's been a little while since I recorded that one. Uh, peek behind the curtain here. But <laughs> uh, I looked at that, listened to that one, and remembered that Robin Wilson was brought up in book three as the person who'd been kind of a like slave sort of to Jessica. to be doing yes. chores and stuff. And that is the Robin that we meet in the first pages of this book. Yeah. Made me sad. She, like, carries her books and, like, picks up her dry cleaning. Like, Marissa, did you have dry cleaning in high school? I don't know about you. Like, I don't, not really. Maybe, like, my show choir dresses. I was just going to say clean that. Those, though. We didn't have to clean those. Mary-Kate and I yeah. were in show choir in high school. Hashtag nerd alert. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did not have dry cleaning in high school. Um, and I certainly would never have asked someone else to do it for me. But I also, I wasn't Jessica Wakefield in high school. I don't, we might have had a few Jessica Wakefields, but I don't think. I, I don't know if Jessica Wakefields um, exist in Chesterton, Indiana. I just don't think that that's like a possibility of where they would, <laughs> where they would live. Uh, but maybe, I don't know. That's part of the book that's so hard for me to grasp is all the stuff that goes on, like, you know, we went to a typical high school, but people really weren't that cruel. You know, I mean, this book is cruel in many ways. And I just, even though people were mean, of course, sometimes there's a lot of hormones and whatnot in high school. I don't remember anyone ever being that mean or saying things like that were said in this book. So that was hard for me to understand. I agree. I think I have that feeling a lot reading this book. Maybe we were fortunate in both our high school and maybe our position in the high school hierarchy, which was sort of like a kind of off to the side middle position of like neither scorn nor particularly high praise. Um, we were at high school at a time when I think a lot of the like nerd nerds and music nerds ended up kind of being the same nerds. Like we yes. should obey music, drama, like in our classes was kind of all the same group of people. And yes. that in a weird way sort of created a certain amount of protection because you couldn't be too pigeonholed and you knew a lot of people. Yeah, we had a safety net of sorts. Uh, People did not fat shame each other in our nerd classes. There were many other things to make fun of for people, but fat shaming was not one of the things that came up for sure. I think also the school was big enough that if somebody was a dick to you, you just avoided them. Or if you didn't like somebody and you were inclined to be mean to them, you just, like, wouldn't hang out with them. But, right. So, um, so we're talking about a lot of mean things that happen in this book, but let's dive in. Let's, let's talk through the plot. Okay. So, as we were teasing, um, Robin, uh, that we met in book three, Robin Wilson, is here at the beginning of this book. And really right off the bat, Robin is showing up at the Wakefield's house, and she's looking for Jessica... Jessica is not there. Like, she's been doing chores all day. And Robin's mom has called the Wakefield's house. And she wants to basically say, hey, it would really mean a lot to Robin to get into Pi Beta Alpha. Yep. And that's when I started hating my best friend, Marissa Flax Bart, because <laughs> there is a fucking sorority in a high school. Like, I just, I can't. I can't, Marissa. I knew from that moment, like, pages into this book this was going to be torture. and But I did this for you. This is all for you, best friend across the country. Thank you. I kept reading. You texted me. You were like, what the hell is this? Why is there a sorority in this high school? Which is the reaction that I had when I first read about PBA. But PBA shows up in the first book, and you just get used to it, you know? You just got to keep yes. going, and eventually it just seems normal. Yes. And there's the fraternity, too, which will oh, factor into great. later books. That's as you can imagine, is no good. So... Robin wants 
to be in Pi Beta Alpha because it will like make her life worth living at school. But the mom says Robin is actually thinking about dropping out of high school because she hates it so much and she, there's nothing for her there. It's so weird. Like she's a smart girl. She's getting good grades. Yeah, she seems very smart, very put together. I mean, I think we can all relate to wanting to be a part of something really, really badly. Um, but wanting to drop out of school for it, I mean, that's a very dramatic high school thing to say, but it sounds like her mom believed it. Yeah, and I guess one thing that this does shed a light on, Robin's behavior in the beginning of this book is problematic. Um, But the book would have us believe that what's problematic about Robin is her eating, when what's really problematic about Robin is her willingness to kind of live this lie. Like, she's not seeing that her relationship with Jessica is totally one-sided. She's not seeing Jessica for who she is. All she wants is to be in PBA, and she's not seeing that that's kind of... These girls are not really the people that she wants to be friends with. But um, right away, the book changes something about Robin. And we were discussing in Playing With Fire, book three, we talked about how... I got really mad, actually, about how the book doesn't let Robin eat food and the idea like Winston Egbert says that anyway go back and listen to episode three because I get really up on my soapbox about this but yeah Robin do. doesn't eat a lot in book three she just is fat and is assumed to be a person that eats a lot because she is fat oh god I can already feel the fire like coming out. Uh, so well in this that. book like they make her a total caricature of herself and like she's shoving candy bars in her mouth like whenever yeah. something good happens and like basically she's putting like cheesecake down her pie hole like it's like it's bad it's yeah. real bad yeah she starts off the book pulling out a giant chocolate bar from her purse which whatever you know i keep a chocolate bar in my purse sometimes i probably wouldn't like plop down and eat the whole thing what i do with candy bars as is well documented is i forget that they're in my purse and Nobody uh, else forgets that they have chocolate in their purse, by the way. But I find them later. It's it's only, like, hey. That's only you. If there's chocolate in my purse, it's there for about seven minutes. Well, but Robin has not one but two candy bars that she pulls out in this he first does. meeting with Elizabeth. So she comes to Elizabeth and kind of reiterates this. Oh, Pi Beta Alpha, that would be awesome. Elizabeth doesn't like PBA. So she's like, oh, Robin, are you sure? But she's <laughs> like, you know what? I bet Jess is just stringing you along. She's told you she'll put you up for PBA. She's never going to. This is when the showdown starts. She's like, Robin, yeah, I'm going to do it. I could put you up for PBA. Yeah, and I think that that's a good thing that she did that. Her um, intentions are good. Her intentions are good at this point, I believe. Yeah. So Robin's name comes up at the PBA meeting, and there's a weird thing where the rest of the girls in Pi Beta Alpha are like, oh, well, this seems weird, but Robin Wilson, really? Pi Beta Alpha? But she's friends with the Wakefield twins, so we're never going to vote against her, like, I guess. Yep. <laughs> and I then, guess that's a thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, because they're, they're power, power twins of the high school, <laughs> I guess. But, of course, Jessica has her own little power triad, uh, her triumvirate of uh, leadership and bitchiness, Lila Fowler, Kara Walker, Jessica Wakefield, and they plot together, they are going to put Robin through some intense hazing. The original Mean Girls. So the first thing that happens hazing-wise is already super embarrassing. Elizabeth shows up at school, and Robin is running around the track. Like, yes. in front of everyone. And everybody's watching and, like, laughing. Like, the whole school is watching her and, like, go, fatty, go. Like, it's awful. yeah. At one point in the book, like, there's literally a quote that says, you'll dent the track. Oh. I threw the book, Marissa. I was sitting on my couch, and I threw it. I threw the book. And I'm telling you, I finished this book because I love you, not because I like this book. <laughs> okay. You'll dent Thank you the again. track. You'll dent you the track. Like, oh like, my are God, you kidding me? so fascinating. No. No. I don't okay. think that these books could exist in this form today, which is a good thing, I think. Um, you know, it's kind of nostalgic to see how far we've, we've come. Um, but, and again, you and I are very lucky that in our high school, for whatever reason, like that, we, we just didn't have that. But I'm just thinking of high schoolers now reading this book and thinking, like, that's tough stuff, and I don't like it. Th- yeah. Thinking about being a high schooler now, 
with social media and everything else. Um, That's true. How, there are different the ways that people could get very easily bullied. And as we know about the internet, it provides this um, anonymity that can bring out the worst in somebody that is inclined to be bad. 100%. And to be mean. Yes. So, thankfully, the Wakefields and Robin Wilson and all of the people at Sweet Valley High don't have the internet yet, but unfortunately, that means they have to be cruel to each other in person, and um, there is, just to give you a taste, I have earmarked and page marked a lot of this book because I honestly wish I could read the whole thing to you listeners, just so you could just get a sense of just how crazy and outrageous the whole thing is, but... Uh. She's running around um, the track. Oh, first of all, to back up a little bit, I earmarked this moment right after uh, Robin finds out that she's been nominated for PBA and her nomination has been accepted. And she's leaving the gym after she's told Lila, Kara, and Jessica how happy she is. She's leaving the, or the cafeteria. And the book says, As the three sorority girls got up to leave, Lila whispered to Jessica, what a drab little existence. Let's get out of here before she offers us another eclair. An ecstatic Robin closed the door and headed straight for the kitchen, pulling a whole cherry cheesecake from the refrigerator. She began eating to calm her nerves. At last, uh, she, Robin Wilson, was actually going to be a Pi Beta Alpha. She was Marissa! All she had to do was to get through pledging. How hard could it be? Oh... My God! I so need clearly, to say they're that. not in the cafeteria. I don't know where they are. Where was I? Um, so she passed the first quote test. Well, so she's running around the track, and while yeah. they're watching her on the track, here's another. This is man, Lila is always a bitch, but such a bitch in this book. Lila yeah. says. Don't you think dear Robin looks tray chic in her gray sweatshorts and tank top? Lila contributed. So perfect for that round body, Miss Ha. The group laughed again. Uh, and Robin even says when Elizabeth is like, Robin, how are you doing? Robin's like, not great. I never looked good in shorts. Which is kind of funny, uh, but also like, really? That's what you're worried about? Well, just all the clothing stuff in here. Uh, they call any kind of dress she wears a tent dress or a tent robe. Right. And I realize this is the 80s, and if you're fat, they just throw a bunch of fabric on you. That's how you roll. But, I mean, a tent dress, a like, tent that dress. just... Or, you know, she just had a dress on. I don't know. Uh, Marissa? Well, speaking of tent dresses, the next challenge is... It's seemingly insurmountable. The disco marathon is happening, the speech disco, and they say that Robin has to get Bruce Patman to take her to the disco marathon. And she's like, that's just never going to happen. But Liz is like, basically, Jessica, I see what you're trying to do. This sucks. And secretly, she's going to, like, con Bruce Patman. This is very tricky for Elizabeth, and we've given yes. her a lot of shit for being a kind of a doormat. She's no doormat in this book. No, so she's she not. She talks to Bruce Patman. Yes, she takes her journalism skills. Yes, and as a journalist, how did you feel about yes. this? I mean, sometimes you do what you got to do to get, you know, get some information, and that and that's what she did. Um, but let me tell you, having never read any of these books, the first passage that I ever read about Bruce Patman went something like this: "Quote, Bruce Patman prided himself on three things: his black Porsche, his good looks, and his tennis." That's all I need to know about Bruce Patton. The end. That's about right. Um, but so you, know, you were like, ooh, I have a crush on that guy. Yeah, I mean, I'm totally all over him. For Save sure. it for the boys section of the podcast, Mary Kate. They oh, talk yeah. about how much you love Bruce Patton. Oh, my God, so much. Um, but, you know, Jessica does the right thing and uses his tennis. His, Elizabeth. Yes, yeah, sorry. Does the right Elizabeth, thing. She uses his tennis. Yeah. She uses his tennis uh, to get what she wants, which, you know, again, I think is coming from a good place, I believe. Yeah, she says, like, I will write the story about you in the paper and how you're going to be first in doubles or something like that, first in singles. Yes. First in singles. So she gets him to agree to take Robin to the dance, but then Robin still has to ask him out herself, and Elizabeth doesn't tell Robin what she did. She's just like, ask him, I promise, he'll say yes. Yeah. He does say yes. He takes her to the disco marathon. And then, oh, my God. Oh, but before, this uh -huh. is the tent dress thing. 
<laughs> when she shows up with the disco marathon, Andre's Patman's arm, and it's, they, they float in on a cloud, and she's wearing, quote, a prettier tent dress than usual. Uh, like, aw, that's from Elizabeth's perspective. Oh, that's a prettier tent dress than usual, Robin. That's uh, all there is for Robin Wilson. So, for Robin. Oh my God. So they float in on a cloud to the beach disco. Everybody's like an like, 80s wonderful movie. I mean, just like you can imagine it. It's so beautiful. And then it turns into like a horror movie. Seriously, this is worse than the beginning of Carrie. Like, this is so yes. much worse than having like tampons thrown at you. It even says, I'm going to read this whole section. Bear with me. <clears throat> and then it happened. There was a momentary lull in the music, and Bruce's voice could be heard clearly as he stepped away from Robin, leaving her alone in the center of the floor. Okay, that's it. I brought you to the dance, Tubby. I've got better things to do now. Hey, anybody want to steer the Queen Mary around the floor tonight? She's all yours. And Bruce walked out. End of chapter. An end of our friendship. Yen. You're mad at me over that? You should be mad at Bruce. I'm mad at you. Oh. <laughs> you sound like Jessica, who's mad at Elizabeth. For I'm us. transferring my anger to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, Bruce Patman, man, you are a douchebag to the max. It's so gross. Um, you think you could just hold it together for one dance and then just walk away and go hang out with somebody else. And it would have been cool, but or no. Just do what, like, kind of jerky or scared boys in the high schools and middle schools across the country have been doing for years, which is like you take your date there and then you're like, oh, I'm gonna go hang with the dude. Exactly. Don't like, yeah. I mean, is that better? I don't know. Maybe this is, maybe that's not better. I don't know. Then he's leading her on. No, but Robin doesn't really like Bruce Patman. It's just that she has to take him. So then she's passed all the tests. Great, she's in PPA, right? No, she's not. So Jessica moves the meeting where they're going to vote on Robin getting into PBA to Carol Walker's house. And then when Elizabeth asks her about the meeting, she's like, how did you find out that we moved it? So not very smooth. Elizabeth's like, "Um, so obviously you were trying to keep me from going. Um, The reason Jessica's trying to keep Elizabeth from going, I think, is because she doesn't want um, Elizabeth to, like, bear witness to what's going to happen. Which is really very simple. Can you tell us what happened? So poor Robin gets blackballed. Which literally. Literally blackballed. Like um, what I mean is there's literally a black ball. Like yeah. Dropped it. They vote with marbles because this is the fucking the They vote society. with marbles and they put them in a is it a box of some sort? Some sort of magic box of And when they open that box and there's a black marble in it. It's all over for poor Robin. All over. It's like, <gasps> what? Yeah. Oh, it's and so we just tragic. don't know who did it. It doesn't matter who did it. It doesn't matter who did it. That's true. It's anonymous voting. It doesn't matter who did it. Who could possibly have done it? I don't know. Who could have done it? Keep in mind that. Some hoe bag. Theoretically, like, everybody could have blackballed Robin because they just didn't feel like it. But this is not really how the voting works. It's kind of like, well, you were nominated. Essentially, you're in. And all of these other steps, the hazing, um, the voting was even a possibility of blackballing is basically just a formality. Um, it's important to understand that because otherwise there would have been a lot more tension in Robin's head about like whether or not she's going to get in. But it's not quite like a real sorority in that like you could still maybe be out. Or I don't know if real sororities work. I don't know how real sororities, sororities work. Yeah. I'm so glad I have no idea. I know people had good experiences in sororities, so I'm not like yeah. trying to be mean about that. But like I don't, I don't know how they work. Uh, yeah. But this was not good, and, you know, you dread Robin finding out what happened. So they call Robin, and they tell her to come on over to Casey's for pizza, and Robin is so excited, and then they break it to her. Yeah. And then she doesn't come to school for a few days, right? Yeah. And everyone's kind of worried about her. It's really kind of amazing. I'm going to read again. This is going to be a okay. reading heavy episode. I hope everyone's cool with that. They're sitting at Casey's and um, Robin has just heard the news that she was blackballed. Robin was as white as chalk. As Jessica's message sank in, her eyes widened into a stare filled with pain and long suppressed anger. Long suppressed. Editor's note. Long suppressed. Uh-huh. Long suppressed. <laughs> but they can't! She screamed 
tears of frustration falling from her eyes. I know you feel it leaves you out of everything worth having at Sweet Valley High, said Jessica sweetly, but I'll still be your best friend. Elizabeth couldn't believe her ears. Oh, Jess, shut up. What? Shut up? Jessica cried plaintively. Um, and I could go on. I could just read the whole book for every page yeah. of the book. It's all like, I re- read this whole book both, you know, 10, 11 years ago when I first read this book, and now I read the book with just like, wide-eyed, just like horror with every page. But we haven't even gotten to the really fucked up part of this book. I even said that weird because it was fucked up. That's how weird it was. Yes. Yes. Um, Because what happened next is Robin's transformation. Which is great. Transformation story, right? Before and after. Everybody loves a good transformation. Get that before and after pic of Robin. I'm on Instagram. You call it a transformation. I call it a eating disorder. Tomato, tomato, Marissa. Really. I mean, you know. But she eats cottage cheese in a single lettuce leaf or something, right? That's, I mean, that's good protein. You know, that's great. That's great. Sounds like she's on the ketogenic diet. That's great. The ketogenic light. And she starts running around the track all the time. She's walking around the halls like a zombie. Like She's like a woman possessed. And nobody really notices, but Robin is losing weight. This is where we get into the time warp portion of the book. (laughs) The fact that this could even happen over the course of the school year is really surprising, but, like, it would have to take the whole school year, right, for her to go from, like, shockingly obese or whatever, however fat she seems to be, to, um, like, the same size as everybody else. I would say at least a semester, but... Probably too. Oh, oh, same as everybody else at Sweet Valley High, I mean. The yeah. weird thing about, as I said in the previous episode, it's a weird thing about this book is that it makes it seem like Robin is the only fat person at the school. She might it's be, for all we know. Yeah, she may be. <laughs> and um, becomes, uh, she basically, she becomes a, a, a thin person over the course of the book. Um, and she's like a surprise thin person at the toward the end and then everybody's like look at that hottie who's that like it's like yeah. almost as if she disappeared and became thin and then came back but she's been there the whole time but people aren't really noticing that she's she's like oh that's part of her plan oh mary kate i'm seeing now this is part of her plan to become <laughs> sort of invisible so nobody notices her change ah maybe like a she's all that situation my favorite teenage movie yeah We'll elaborate on that. Well, you know, she went from this angry person, which it sounds like Robin really is after all this happens for a little bit, and then she just comes out of her shell because someone gives her a makeover. Now, no one gives poor Robin a makeover. Robin takes it into her own hands in this situation. Um, But she comes back, and people are like, wow, she's a hottie. And I don't know how far ahead we're going, but Robin... Let's go ahead. Okay. Well, Robin gets nominated for... Miss Sweet Valley. (laughs) Miss Sweet Valley. Homecoming Queen. Homecoming Queen. This is after and she's tried out for cheerleading. Oh, that's right. And she made it, and people are losing their shit. Well, right. at least one person is losing their shit. Miss Jessica. She cannot handle it. She's like, she's totally a zombie, and she's like, <laughs> totally a scatterbrain. She's like coming up with any insult she can. And Bruce Patman is like, who's that hottie? And they're also yeah. calling her Wrecker Wilson and saying, like, she can wreck me anytime, which I don't really understand how that's a compliment, but... Yeah. Well, let's talk about the sign that somebody made for her. Uh, because apparently, like, you make signs like you would in an election um, okay. to become this Sweet Valley High Queen. And one of the signs says, Robin has us throbbing. Robin has us throbbing, yes! O-M-F-G, Marissa. What is happening? I well, do not like this. what do you like think this. is throbbing? Or means oh, well, throbbing? I don't, I don't want to talk. I don't even want to think about what's gentlemen. throbbing for these when high school boys Robin. making signs. Like, first of all, high school boys don't really make signs. But when they make th- signs that say that they're throbbing, like, I, like I'd rather not discuss this. They meant their hearts, okay? Oh, sure. Yes, sure. Their yes. hearts are throbbing. Right. Okay. <laughs> But, so, this actually gets into a territory where the more I think about it, the more I have mixed feelings. Like, I don't like that Robin has to undergo this transformation to 
like find herself. She doesn't go through like just an inner like searching and realizing that these bitches aren't worth it and then just being happy with herself. Instead, she has to like she has to have a total radical physical transformation and that's sort of like the lesson that weirds me out. But one thing that I will say is that the person that Robin becomes internally through this process is kind of badass. Like like her her inner fire is like stoked and she suddenly is like she is like fuck these bitches and she is she comes up with a scheme she she once she tries out for cheerleading um and she makes it elizabeth asks her and we see a totally new robin here elizabeth asks her uh off the record how does it feel to shove it all down their throat (laughs) <laughs> Heavenly, Robin giggled. Then she regained her composure. Well, I don't care about them. Although, let me tell you, Liz, you haven't seen anything yet. Love and, it. Love it. And Liz says, I hope you're not going overboard, Robin. And Robin says, don't worry, Liz. I've learned how to swim with sharks. So Woo! Robin's like, yes. she's got a new, a new fire. I mean, she, she does. And I she like comes up with this new drive. Like, in order to become Miss Sweet Valley, it's not just like, I'm going to run and they're going to love me. She actually comes up with a really, like, kind of like um, House of Cards sort of scheme of, like, manipulation and uh, spin, like, like PR spin. Oh, my God. Marissa, it's a different Robin doing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> OMG. Yeah. It's fantastic. So yes, she you're right. This sign in on a bulletin board at the school, and the sign says, "Challenge accepted." It has come to my attention that members of Pi Beta Alpha have forbidden any girl who is not a member to go out for Miss Sweet Valley High. I know all about the PBA. They blackball me. I accept their challenge. I ask for your vote, Robin Wilson. So it's a very like succinct and pissy and like fuck those bitches. If, forgive me for all the language, but I mean. Fuck them. Uh, seriously. Seriously. They deserve all the F-bombs in the world right now. And then she wins Miss Sweet Valley. She wins. She wins. She earned that. And Bruce Patman is going to be her escort to drive her around <laughs> in his Porsche. Yeah. And then, so she's in the, in the Porsche. She's having this triumphant moment. And she's like, this is my driver, Bruce, and my date, this guy, Alan Waters, who is the photographer. Yes. Walters, Alan yes. Walters. Yes. Big um, fan. <laughs> and so, yeah, so Robin's changed. She's won the day, and she's lost all this weight, and you sh- we should feel triumphant, except we close the book feeling just kind of disgusted, and why was this the lesson of this book? And sad. So true. The lesson of the book is just lose some weight, and you can win all the things in high school, which is not true. No, that's the, that is, that's the lesson for Robin, and I think, just to really spell it out for anyone who might be confused or is feeling this and wishing that we would say it, the thing that is so frustrating to me about this situation with Robin is that it perpetuates this idea that uh, people are fat because they're lazy, um, which frankly, if I'm going to be honest, is an idea that I have really... Um, had to battle with a bit in my own life. I think of myself as someone with a pretty positive self-image, but I've also never been a thin person. I've never been a person that's heavy enough that I really get made fun of for it, but I'm not a thin person, and I always, like growing up, for a long time, I had this idea that if I just tried hard enough with watching my diet and with my exercise, that I would transform myself into a person that you know, was the size 10 even. Like, you know, I would I would lose this certain amount of weight and then I would be slim. And that works, it does work for some people. But there are also a lot of bodies that, you know, eat healthy diets and, you know, get exercise and are not lazy. And their bodies are the size that they are. And coming to terms really just in my 30s, honestly, with the idea that, like, you know what, maybe this is the size that my body is and I'll, I'll try to be healthy like don't stop the fight to be healthy but don't try to idealize some future weight that you're going to be was hugely instrumental in 
my um, my own just sort of feelings of like self worth and how I'm going to spend my time. Totally, and you know, I I never struggled with weight stuff in high school. Again, we we were just like I don't know, I don't know like. I don't even remember what size pants I wore in high school. Like, I don't remember even looking at that, uh, where, you know, this is it's very specific in this book. Like, you know the sizes of everybody. But, you know, in my 30s, your body changes, you, you know, everything changes. And so for me, it's very sad in this book. Um, and something that has taken me a long time to realize is just because you lose 15 pounds or 20 pounds or however much weight that. Uh, Robin loses it doesn't necessarily make you happy and in this book I think they're really kind of saying that it does and I'm just gonna go ahead and say that that's not that's not true that's not necessarily true that's such a good point and a different point from the one I'm making like so here's two sides of the same thing both that just putting your mind to it is not necessarily going to make you a thin person. And also, the fact that you're fat doesn't mean that you're disgusting or doesn't mean that, or the fact that you're overweight, I guess I should say, doesn't mm-hmm. mean that you are fucking up. It doesn't mean that you're doing your life wrong. Like, you could, that could just be how your body is. But furthermore, losing weight, losing even a lot of weight, doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to be happier like Robin becomes, and it doesn't necessarily, isn't going to make you some sort of, like, better or more valuable person. That's Absolutely. Important. Totally. And that, so that kind of breaks my heart thinking about maybe high schoolers or middle schoolers who are picking up this book now and going, that's the answer. That's the answer. I just need to lose a little bit of weight and I'm going to be happier and more popular and get to do the things I want to do. And man, that breaks my heart thinking that, that there are people out there thinking that that's the answer because they're going to get there and, it, and they're going to be just as unhappy. And that makes me sad. If anybody is interested in reading just, like, the most amazing, like, essential, required reading book about some of these concepts, I highly recommend the book Shrill by Lindy West. Yes. It was just, it was really, it was both eye-opening and edifying, and I honestly think men and women, fat or thin, absolutely, like, required reading. The audiobook I listen to is great, too. She reads it herself. Yes. I think that now is the time in our podcast where we talk about boys. Oh, boy. There's really only one boy in this book that I want to talk about. And his name is Alan Walters. We mentioned him in oh. passing. Yeah. Alan Walters is described as the tallest, smartest, perhaps shyest boy at Sweet Valley High. And he's a photographer for the newspaper. That's like his extracurricular. Yeah. What yeah, I mean, he was a good guy. I think that he's a good guy. And, you know, obviously I haven't read any of the other books, but I hope he comes back around. And I hope that he gets more storyline because he seems like he has a good heart. And he's just trying to do the right thing, and he's really trying to take care of people. So, well, so what happens with um, Alan in the story, the role that he plays, is that basically he's just at the disco marathon, and Elizabeth asks him to run after Robin. After Bruce shames Robin, Robin runs off, and Elizabeth's like, oh shit, I gotta do something, like, let's not let her run off into the night by herself. And she sends Alan after Robin. Robin is crying, she, like, looks up and says something like, oh, who's my Prince Charming that's come to save me? And she looks and she's like, Alan Walters, oh my God, like with disgust. And then she immediately <laughs> regrets it. She's like, oh man, this is, I'm as bad as Bruce if I'm going to shrug this guy off. And then they start talking and he mentions how he doesn't ever know what to say, but he loves the old movie guys like, you know, Humphrey Bogart. And I'm just like, oh my God, I think I love you, Alan Walters. Alan Walters is my dream man. I think you're right, Marissa. I mean, aside from him being a fellow photographer, be still my heart. Uh, he just seems like a gentleman. Uh, unlike I love tall guys, too. tall and smart, love it. Yeah, great, great combo for sure. This is a very shallow podcast, so I had to switch right to the physical aspect as well. But smart is not is not necessary. It's not a physical aspect at all. Not only no. not necessarily, but in no way a physical aspect. <laughs> Smart, that's like maybe my number one thing. He, he needs to have a sense of humor. 
and Alan Walters does. He loves movies. Amazing. And he's and sensitive. Like, he sensitive. just, he understood what was going on, and he just decided that he needed to, to go, which I love. I love him. I love Alan, I love you, Alan Walters. Call me. <laughs> hey, no. Then we're going to, it's going to be Marissa versus MK, just like in the first Sweet Valley books, because we're both after him. Mary-Kate, you know you're married. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> a beautiful boy is a beautiful boy. Sweet Valley Diaries is sponsored in part by the Dairy Burger. Whether you're celebrating the Spartans' latest football victory over juicy cheeseburgers and hot, greasy french fries, or drowning your feelings in a frosty chocolate milkshake after Rick Andover ruined your reputation all over again, The Dairy Burger is the place to eat and drink all your feelings, guilt-free. No fatties, though. It's a confusing policy, but that's what makes us special. The Dairy Burger. That's dairy, with an I. So now is the part of the show where I ask you a very important question that I ask all of my guests. And the question is, are you a Jessica or an Elizabeth? Marissa. I can't believe you'd even ask me this, but honestly, um, I'm going to say that I'm a Robin. Oh, I, I am going to say I'm a Robin, not necessarily, you know, going through exactly what she did in this book, but I, I feel like I felt like if I just do this, then I'll be happy. Or if I just do, you know, this thing, or I'm on, you know, doing this thing, then I'll have reached success. And I'm not talking about in high school, but you know, as a photographer, if I'm just published in this magazine, then I'll, you know, be happy or successful. And I, I just, I feel, I felt very much like a Robin while I was reading this book. I like that answer. And continuing the trend of populating the world of Sweet Valley with all of us. <laughs> um, well, yes. Which I'm fine with, because if you were going to say you were an Elizabeth, I would have accepted it. But <laughs> I'm the Elizabeth. <laughs> you are totes, Elizabeth. She's scheming a little more than I tend to scheme in this book. But I loved it. I like this new scheming book. She was, I feel like she was scheming truly from a good part of her soul. So I'll take it. Well, Mary-Kate, I want to thank you so much for being here and doing this heinous, heinous thing uh, that <laughs> is reading this book. Um, oh. I don't know if maybe any of my other guests will relate to your uh, hatred of me um, that you were experiencing <laughs> while reading the book, um, but I'm delighting in it. I have to be honest. Only only as someone that I've been friends with for um, what like over 20 years, oh my god, could I subject? <laughs> oh, that's not true. I subject all sorts of people I just met to this. But could I delight so much in uh, their hatred of the experience and of me? Hashtag Marissa Flaxbar ruined my Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> I read this during, uh, um, you know, Christmas break, and I threw the book more than I'd like to admit. But thank you for uh, having me a part of this cool club, and I'm so glad I got to do this. The podcast is like my own little Pi Beta Alpha. It is. And even like Robin, like your uh, spirit animal Robin, even though you hated it, you still want to be in it. Oh, it's so true. I hate that so much about me, but it's so true. (laughs) Jessica with a college guy? Elizabeth fears her twin has gotten in over her head this time. Is she right? Find out in Sweet Valley High number five all night long. <laughs> I can't believe it's called that. <laughs> so dirty. So dirty. So dirty. That's it for this week's episode of Sweet Valley Diaries. Thanks for bearing with me as I learn and grow and make recording mistakes that I'll never make again. Send me an email at sweetvalleydiaries at me.com. Hit me up on Twitter at Sweet Valley or follow me on Instagram at Sweet Valley Diaries. Please rate and review on iTunes if you get a chance. That would be really exciting as we grow. 
Thanks so much to my guest today and my very dear friend, Mary Kate Battles. Thanks to Don Flaxbart, Lauren Shippen, and to Jocelyn Schofield for the use of her song, Beautiful Boys. See you next time. Open your book to page 150. Oh my God, I feel like I'm in church. Yeah, that was the book.